Welcome to part one of development for infrastructure. My name is Michael Levan. Thank you so much for joining me today. And what I want to do is I want to talk a little bit about what this series is going to look like. So first and foremost, there's going to be about seven to eight weeks, give or take, and each week is going to have its own topic. And the goal with each week is to kind of build up on top of each other. Now we're going to see a few different parts. The first part is going to be we're going to talk about theory. Now I know theory is not the most fun thing in the world. Maybe not everybody comes to YouTube for theory. However, theory is, as everybody knows, one of the most important parts. So we are going to talk a little bit about theory about like what we're kind of doing. And it's going to be real small, maybe two to three minutes, I'm, I'm averaging actually maybe even one to two minutes. And then we're going to go into a demo. So we're going to kind of demo everything that we've talked about. And then what I'm going to do is I'm going to point you to a bunch of different references and resources that you can use for part one, we're going to be talking about some developer concepts, things like imperative, declarative, procedural based programming, object oriented based programming. We're going to look at what these terms actually mean. And then we're going to dive into a little bit of code to show all of these. Let's talk about a little bit of theory. So first, we're going to talk about declarative. Now declarative means tell me what to do, not how to do it. And you're going to see this in languages like Terraform, cloud formation, go. And then we also have imperative. Now imperative is tell me how to do it. Tell me how to do this thing. And you're going to see that a lot in Java, C sharp and C plus plus. So there are a few languages like Python that can be both declarative and imperative. And even with Python, Python can also be functional based object oriented based Python is very, very versatile. So then we have something called mutable versus immutable. Now, when you think of mutable, you think you could change me all you want, do anything to the code, create the new resource, and it'll be perfectly fine. Now, immutable is, well, you can kind of sort of change me. So for example, let's think about Terraform, and I'm probably gonna use Terraform just because it's an infrastructure as code language, so I feel that you know people that are moving from infrastructure to development or trying to implement development into their day-to-day It'll be a little bit easier if I reference Terraform. Now Terraform is actually an immutable language, which means it can't be changed. But the thing is, it can kind of sort of be changed. So for example, let's say you create a resource in Terraform, like a virtual machine, and you want to change the size of that virtual machine. Well, here's the thing you can, but you need to have a state. So that TF state needs to exist so you can change it. However, on the flip side, Let's say you don't have that TF state and you create a virtual machine and then you go to edit that virtual machine or something like that. Terraform will tell you, hey, this resource already exists. I can't do anything with it unless you delete it and we recreate it. And then finally, for the theory aspect, we have procedural versus OOP versus functional. Now, procedural is essentially a set of steps that can be carried out in your program. So if step one is to add two plus two and step two is to add three plus three, that would be, be your procedure. And then you have object oriented and it looks like I accidentally put oops instead of OOP. <laughs> so OOP, not with an S, just OOP, it defines classes and from those classes you can create objects. So the class could be a car and then that car can have multiple objects. The year it was created, what model it is, who created it, and then you have functional. So functional, think about it like a mathematical function. You have X and Y amount of arguments, and then those arguments return a specific value to you. So with that, let's jump into a little bit of code and see a few of these in action. Now, the one thing that I do want to point out is this, of course, is not all of the developer theory. This is not all of the computer science theory. However, when you're moving from infrastructure to development, these appear to be, from what I've seen, the most important concepts that you should at least start with to hit the ground running. First, let's start off with immutable and mutable. Now, the one thing that I do want to say is I'm going to be using Terraform, which is written in HCL. I'm going to be using Python and I'm going to be using Go. The one thing to keep in mind is you don't have to need to know all of these languages right now. This is really more about to go over the concepts that we spoke about in a hands on fashion. So it's not just theory. I want to be able to show you exactly what's happening. 
So the first thing is we're going to look at the main.tf configuration. The main.tf configuration is doing something very, very straightforward. It's simply creating an Azure resource group. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to CD into a mutable and mutable and I'm gonna run Terraform init. Now when you run Terraform init, what it does is it brings down a plugin for you, AKA the Azure plugin to be able to use Terraform to interact with Azure. It's called a provider. And then it brings down any other initializations that you need. Next, you're gonna run Terraform plan. And what Terraform plan does is it essentially looks through all of your code from like a syntax perspective, from a versioning perspective, and just making sure that it looks as it's supposed to for the HCL syntax. All right, so it looks like we're all good here. And now I'm gonna run Terraform apply. And what Terraform apply is gonna do is it's gonna actually go through and try to create our resource. We're gonna type yes here and yes means we're essentially telling Terraform, yep, create a resource for us. And as we can see, the resource has been created. So let's say I wanted to, for example, change the location. I can change it to maybe central US. So I'm gonna run Terraform plan again. And what this is gonna do is it's gonna go through and it's gonna confirm that, okay, yep, this is gonna be the change that we want. We wanna be able to change the location from East US to Central US. And if we scroll up here, we can see specifically that it says it's forcing a replacement. So this is where immutable comes into play. So when you think immutable with Terraform, this is, a, this is pretty much saying that the resource will be replaced. It's, it's not going to be changed. It's not going to be updated. It's going to be replaced. The whole thing is going to be ripped out and a new one is going to be put in. So those are the different things that you can see from immutable versus mutable. I'm going to close out the terminal here. I'm going to close out my main.tf. And then what I'm going to do is I'm going to open up my object oriented or OOP example. And this is object.py. So what this is doing is I'm creating a class and think of a class like a blueprint. Like if you're looking at like a diagram blueprint or a schema or something, think of that like your class. And then you have different objects that you're defining in your class. So you can do things like specify the make, you can do things like specify the model. And then what you can do is you can initialize that class to be able to use those different objects. And that's exactly what we see here. So on line one, we're creating our class. On lines two through four, we're initializing two objects, make and model. And then we're initializing our object with the my car variable. And then that variable equals the car class. And then we're passing in two arguments. The two arguments are Honda and Civic. Now, of course, this could be anything that you want. So for example, I drive a Ford F-150. So I'm gonna say Ford F-150. I'm going to save that. So now my variable is initialized with my car class. Next on lines eight and nine, we're printing out those values because we want to see what those values look like. Now, of course, you don't have to print them out. You can just, you know, use them throughout your code wherever you want. But this is just to show you from a visual perspective what you can do here. So as we can see, we're doing my car, which is the variable dot make and dot model. So for example, let's say I go up here and I do a dot notation here, you're gonna see the different things that are available. Now, specifically, you have your two objects, your two values, make and model. So I'm just gonna go ahead and I'm gonna put that back. So it's gonna be printing out make and model. So I'm gonna highlight this. I'm going to scroll down here, run Python file in terminal. And as we can see, it prints out Ford F-150. Now, of course, you don't have to print out both values. So for example, I'm just gonna get rid of the model here and this is just gonna print out the make for me. So it's just, it should just print out Ford. I'll run that and then as we can see, it prints out Ford. So that's an object oriented way to program. You can essentially create a class, you can create multiple objects and then you can use those objects and assign values to those objects. Next and finally, we're gonna look at procedural based. So I'm gonna open up this main.go here. And again, same rules apply. If you don't have experience in Go, it's perfectly okay. I don't expect you to know the syntax here. I just wanna show you what procedural looks like. 
So let's look at line nine before we look at anything else. Don't worry about package and import and stuff like that. Just worry about line nine right now. Now what line nine is doing is it's creating something called a function. And this function passes in two arguments or two parameters, X and Y. And this is really where like the mathematical aspect of procedural comes into play. So you have X and Y, and then those two values are gonna be integers. And then as we can see right here, int is also being returned. So you're passing in two integers as arguments and then you're returning an integer. Now on line 10, this is the mathematical equation that we're using. We're literally just doing x plus y. Now, it doesn't necessarily mean like you don't have to use procedural based stuff just to do math. You know, this is just an example. Just math is just easy to show for, for an example like this. Next, you have on line 12, you're printing out the value of add and then you're returning add. So now let's look at lines five through seven. Your main function in Go is essentially what you use nine times out of 10 to be able to call different sub functions that you have. So we're calling our add to function and we're passing in two arguments. So the first argument is two, which is what X is. And then the second argument is three, which is what Y is. So essentially what's gonna happen is the add to function is gonna run two plus three, which should give us five. Let's go ahead and check on that. So I'm gonna CD into procedural and I'm gonna type go run main.go. That's how you kick off a Go program. So I'm gonna run that. And as we can see, the output is five. So the procedural aspect here is that you are passing in arguments and you have functions and then you're returning a specific value. So you're returning that integer and that integer is gonna be X plus Y. And that concludes part one of development for infrastructure. Thank you so much for watching and we'll see you again next time.